To be efficient on the SAT, you need to memorize the exponent rules. You can often figure out questions that test these rules by using strategies like Arithmetize or Desmos, but those methods will usually take longer, taking time away from much harder questions. First, remember that an exponent is a shorthand for multiplication. 2 to the third means that we're multiplying three twos together, which would equal 8. Similarly, x to the fourth is the same as multiplying four x's together. You should also know that the 2 and x are called the base of the exponent. We also sometimes call exponents powers, so this page shows 2 to the third power and x to the fourth power. We can also say that 2 to the third is 2 cubed. When the exponent is 2, we sometimes say that the base is squared. It's extremely important that you instinctively know how zeros and ones behave with exponents. Since exponents are multiplication, it makes sense that zero raised to any exponent is zero, since anything multiplied by zero will always be zero. It's harder, but very important, to remember that any base raised to the zero power is one. You will use this fact on every single SAT. When the base is one, the exponent won't matter because one raised to any exponent is one. When one is the exponent, it's as if there's no exponent at all. Every base raised to the first power is just the base. Remember that every number without an exponent has a hidden one as the exponent that we don't write unless we need to see it. Before we get into the rules for negatives, let's remember that calculators are very picky about how you use negatives with exponents. If you want to attach an exponent to a negative base, you need to put the negative into parentheses. Your calculator, including Desmos, will not treat these two situations the same way. When the negative is not in parentheses, the calculator follows the order of operations, which I abbreviate as germdas. The calculator resolves the exponent first, then it treats the negative as multiplication. So the first version of negative 2 squared will be shown as negative 4. If we put the negative 2 in parentheses, the calculator treats this as a grouping, so the exponent applies to both parts, giving us the value that we would expect, which is positive 4. The SAT knows about this common mistake, and they could design an entire question to test whether you understand it. When we memorize the rules for negatives and exponents, we can assume that we're thinking about the base in parentheses. In all of these cases, the exponent applies to the entire negative 2. The pattern to memorize is that negative bases raised to even-numbered exponents will have a positive result. You can see this on the left. On the right, we see that negative bases raised to odd-numbered exponents will have a negative result. This happens because of the fact that two negative numbers multiplied together will have a positive product. Even exponents will always pair up our bases evenly, so all of the negatives will cancel out. Odd exponents will always leave one extra negative 2 that makes the entire result negative. The behavior of negative bases is fairly easy to remember if you understand that exponents are a shorthand for multiplication. Negative exponents are a lot harder to understand. My advice is to memorize the rule without worrying about why it works. In general, you can move the base up or down in a fraction to switch the exponent between positive and negative. Most people learn this rule by using x to the negative 1, which is equivalent to 1 over x. But this is hard to understand because both the starting fraction and the final exponent are invisible. To better understand what's happening, first remember that any value can be a fraction if we write it over 1. Now we can see that x to the negative 1 is in the top of the fraction. We should also remember that any number without an exponent is assumed to have the exponent 1. So the x on the bottom right has an exponent of 1. Hopefully the rule makes much more sense now. We moved the base from the top of the fraction to the bottom and switched the exponent from negative 1 to positive 1. Let's look at another example. Here the negative exponent is already on the bottom of the fraction, but it doesn't matter. Just follow the rule. We moved the base from the bottom to the top, and we changed the exponent from negative to positive. In this final example, we start with a positive 2 exponent on the base of x. Following the rule, we can move the base from the bottom to the top and change the exponent from positive to negative. Notice that the 5 does not move with the x. That's because the exponent was not attached to the 5, so we only make changes to the exponent's base, which is x. The 5 has its own unwritten exponent of 1. In each case, you might be wondering why we would make these changes. In other words, is the positive or negative version of the exponent better? On the SAT, that's not really important. 
Generally, I would say that negative exponents are weird, and it's probably best to follow this rule to make the exponents positive. But the SAT is going to ask questions that specifically test whether you know the rule, so making the simplest or best looking expression isn't always the priority. We might also see the negative exponent rule used on ordinary numbers that we're supposed to interpret as fractions. Notice the pattern here. 2 to the negative 1 becomes 1 over 2 because we move the base from top to bottom and switch the negative 1 exponent to an unwritten positive 1. 2 to the negative 2 would become 1 over 2 squared, which simplifies to 1 fourth. And 2 to the negative 3 becomes 1 over 2 cubed, which is 1 eighth. You should be comfortable with the relationship between negative exponents and fractions. No matter how negative exponents appear in an SAT question, it's almost always smart to focus on them first. Many SAT exponent questions will involve multiple exponent rules, and the order in which we simplify them generally won't matter. But negative exponents are confusing, so it's best to make them go away first before you tackle other rules in the question. Moving on, there are also exponent rules for when multiple exponents interact. The order of operations, which I abbreviate as germdas, can help us memorize the rules. Remember that germdas gives us the order for simplifying expressions and solving equations. The letters stand for different operations within equations. G is for groupings, E is for exponents, R is radicals or roots, M is multiplication, D division, A addition, and S subtraction. When we have complex equations to simplify, the E tells us when to use the exponent rules. Coincidentally, the order of germdas also helps us remember the exponent rules themselves. When you have an operation involving two exponents, first identify the operation, then shift right two letters in germdas. Let's start with an easy one. x to the third times x to the second is multiplication of the bases. That's the m in germdas. Shifting right two letters brings us to addition. So when you multiply bases, we add the exponents. So x cubed times x squared is x to the fifth, because 3 plus 2 is 5. Let's look at another example. In this case, we're dividing the bases. That's the d in germdas. Shifting right two letters, we know to subtract the exponents. So x to the sixth divided by x squared is x to the fourth, because 6 minus 2 is 4. In this case, we only have one base, but we still have two exponents. The operation is that we have an exponential term raised to another exponent. Find the e for exponent, shift right two letters, and we're reminded to multiply the exponents. 3 times 2 gives us a result of x to the sixth. This situation looks a little different because we don't seem to have two exponents. But actually, germdas reminds us that exponents and radicals are basically the same thing. Germdas pairs those letters together just like multiplication and division, or addition and subtraction. Go to the R in germdas to be reminded what to do. Shifting right two letters, we know to divide the original exponent by the radical. So the cubed root of x to the fifth is the same as x to the five thirds. This is an important rule that the SAT absolutely loves to ask about. So let's look at another example. In this case, we have a fourth root and an exponent of 12 on the base. Dividing the exponent by the root, we get a fraction of 12 over 4, which we can reduce just like any other fraction, so our final answer is x to the third. Most people learn this rule with a simple square root, but this is confusing because there don't appear to be any exponents or roots here at all. But as is often the case in math, there are sometimes invisible numbers that we don't write. Square roots do not write a 2 in the radical, but it's there if we need it. Similarly, a base without an exponent has a hidden exponent of 1. So the square root of x is equivalent to x to the 1 half. More than the other rules, the SAT really wants you to understand how to reverse this one. So if you're given a fractional exponent like x to the 5 halves, you need to be able to turn that back into radical form. Remember that the top of the fraction is just a regular exponent. The bottom of the fraction is the root number. So x to the 5 halves is equivalent to the square root of x to the 5th. An easy way to remember fractional exponents is that the root is on the bottom of the fraction, just like the roots of a tree are on the bottom of the tree. Moving on, let's try applying the germdas shift to bases that are being added. If we try to shift to the right two letters, we run out of letters. This is definitely a problem, and it's a reminder that we can't actually combine those exponents. You probably know that x to the third and x to the second are different types of terms, so they can't be combined. In most cases, we're going to leave this expression alone. 
The only real exception is when the two terms are the same type, in this case x to the third plus x to the third. But notice that combining them does not change the exponent like it did in the other examples. Basically, it's good to remember that exponents don't mix very well with addition and subtraction. As we said at the beginning, exponents are a condensed version of multiplication, so we're pretty far removed from the simplicity of addition and subtraction. Before we finish, there are two more important warnings that you need to keep in mind when working with exponents. First, the exponent rules for multiplication and division only work if we have the same base. Multiplying 3 to the 7th and 9 to the 4th suggests that we should add the exponents, but we can't at first because 3 and 9 are different bases. In most cases on the SAT, you'd be able to easily change one of the bases to match the other. Usually, we want to take the bigger number and make it look smaller. We know that 9 is the same as 3 squared, so let's make that substitution. Now we have an exponent raised to another exponent on the right, so we should multiply the exponents. 2 times 4 is 8, so now we have 3 to the 7th times 3 to the 8th. Since the bases are both 3, we can now add the exponents to get 3 to the 15th. The rules for dividing bases would work the same way. We'd only be able to subtract the exponents if the bases were the same. Another warning has to do with the process of distribution, a step we use all the time in basic algebra. We have to be careful with how we use it with exponents. It's perfectly fine to distribute exponents when the bases are multiplied or divided. On the left, we have x to the third times y to the fourth in parentheses. The squaring applies to both terms, so we can distribute it. And since we have exponents raised to another exponent, we multiply the exponents, giving us x to the sixth times y to the eighth. Fractions raised to exponents work the same way, because the terms are divided. We can square the 3 and the 5, giving us a simplified fraction of 9 over 25. But we cannot distribute exponents when the terms are added or subtracted. It's extremely tempting to square both terms, but as we said before, exponents do not mix well with addition and subtraction. If a question involved this kind of expression, the SAT will absolutely make one of the answer choices x to the 6th plus y to the 8th, but that would be a trap answer. Instead, we have a more complex process for using exponents with addition and subtraction. We need to expand the group, a process we often call foiling. The actual result has an additional middle term that results from the extra multiplication steps. Rather than summarize all of the rules we've covered in this lesson, I'm going to leave you with this warning about distribution, because it is the single most common algebra mistake that I've seen students make in all of my years teaching the SAT. Desmos and the Arithmetize strategy can sometimes help you avoid exponent traps like this one, but those methods are often more time consuming than simply memorizing the rules we've discussed. If you know the rules confidently, exponent questions might take you just 10 seconds. That's a huge win when every second counts on the SAT.